Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Seeds and Weeds podcast brought to you by Small House Farm. Join us as we talk with gardeners, foragers, herbalists, chefs, and community activists to explore the many ways that plants impact our cultures and cuisines, our history, and our future. I'm your host, Bevan Cohen, and this is Seeds and Weeds. Welcome back to the show, my friends. We have got another great episode for you today. This is actually the 50th episode of Seeds and Weeds, so that's pretty cool. We're going to be sitting down with author and food historian Julia Skinner for what I could possibly say is one of my favorite conversations that we've had on this program. We're going to cover a lot of things here, too. Of course, fermentation, Julia's specialty. Her book, Our Fermented Lives, which is a history of how fermented foods have shaped cultures and communities. We'll talk about which came first, beer or bread. And we'll also dig into Julia's latest project, the Culinary Curiosity School, and her new Fermentation Oracle, which is a beautifully illustrated deck of cards. I even draw a card from the Oracle deck during the interview, and you won't even believe what happens. You're definitely going to want to stick around for that. Things here at Small House Farm are as busy as ever. Lots of events on the calendar, and seed saving season has been in full swing. I've been leading local seed saving workshops all week, and we have been collecting and processing seeds here at Small House Farm basically nonstop. We've got a video or two that we've been working on that'll be coming to the YouTube channel soon. One showcasing the tomatoes of 2024, another one highlighting all of the great bean varieties that we grew this year, and hopefully a highlight reel from the Heirloom Expo. We'll see how that goes. Now, before we jump into the interview with Julia, I do want to give a quick shout out to our community over on Patreon. The support of our Patreon community is what keeps this podcast on the air. If you enjoy our program and would like to support our work, you can always join the Patreon community for as little as $3 a month. And this helps us cover so many of the costs associated with producing the show, like the website, our hosting, as well as the time that goes into recording and editing every episode. There's different tiers of membership, each with their own unique set of perks, right? From exclusive content, special bonus episodes, of the podcast. There's free books, heirloom seeds, seasonal herbal gift boxes. There's really something for everybody. We now have more than 250 members in our Patreon community, and we really, truly appreciate all of your support so much. Thank you to everyone in the community, including our newest members, Diane Jones, Sammy Paskuski, and Molly Clemens. Thank you all so much for your support. We really could not have this podcast without you. If you'd like to join our Patreon community, you can find a link down in the show notes or at our website, seedsandweedspodcast.com. Julia Skinner is a food historian, educator, and founder of Root, a fermentation and food history company that bridges the gap between modern people and historic food. Dr. Skinner holds a PhD in library and information science and is the only historian or food writer in the U.S. to win two 40 under 40 awards in one year. Julia is joining us on the show today to talk about her fermented life. Julia, welcome to the show, my friend. I have really been looking forward to talking with you. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Now, I want to dig into your book as well as your latest offering, The Fermentation Oracle. But before we jump into all that, could you just share a little bit about yourself with our listeners, you know, your background and the work that you do? Sure. So um, my background, I started out kind of in academia. My PhD is in library science. And then I worked in museums and libraries for a while. But I had written about food and been thinking about food and making food and, you know, interacting with food in many ways for, you you know, decades. And so when I left that world full time in 2018, I started writing about food and I started uh, diving more into food history. And I started using all the experience I had fermenting to actually teach fermentation classes and write about fermentation. And so it kind of snowballed into where we are today, which is writing the books, of course, um, writing my newsletters, and then continuing to teach a lot of which I've moved online, which I started to do years ago, as you know, we all did. And now now this uh, this November, I'm actually launching a new culinary school online called the Culinary Curiosity School. So that'll be a lot of fun. Oh, that does sound like fun. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah. So basically, a lot of the classes that I've taught online up to this point have been largely skills based, which is great. Like everyone likes new skills. But I think what a lot of people are missing from classes and what what we find harder to replicate in the online space versus the 
um, in-person class space is that sense of wonder and excitement and curiosity. And so I'm designing classes specifically to help people, sure, you know, learn some skills like produce some food waste, learn fermentation, all these great things, but then also to really spark that sense of curiosity and kind of to encourage them to use the classes as a springboard for their own explorations. So that's where we're going to do all kinds of everything from like, you know, playful food writing to more hands on kind of demo um, sort of classes on fermentation. Um, there's going to be a class called Finding Your Food Story that helps you think about, you know, your own personal relationship to food and all kinds of other stuff. Man, I love that. You're also the founder of something called Root. And I saw the tagline online. It says historic food for the modern world. And I thought that was pretty cool. Could you tell us a little bit more about that as well? Yeah. So Root is um, it is the business I started in 2018 and the culinary school is kind of like a, a sub business under it. Root originally was mostly classes as well as a membership and newsletter. Um, I still have the newsletter. I'm revamping the membership right now. But basically what Root does is it offers people different ways to connect to food history and fermentation. So whereas the Culinary Curiosity School is getting you to connect with um, sort of the like your own curiosity with Root, what I'm doing is I'm writing about food history history and I'm uh, I do consulting for other people's creative projects in a way that helps them connect to that history um, whatever history it is they're trying to connect to you know whether it's you know oh I want to I want to understand how to think about this kind of dish and work it into you know my novel or my movie or whatever or I want to understand the history of this one thing fully for my own interest but there's an emphasis on relevance on like helping people locate where they find relevance and resonance so that the history isn't just like, wow, cool facts, but is very uh, personalized. And we see the ways that it impacts the way that we eat today. Okay, so let's dig into your book here. It's uh, Our Fermented Lives. It came out in 2022. And the subtitle here is How Fermented Foods Have Shaped Cultures and Communities. And I got to tell you, Julia, this book is like right up my alley. Um, I'm a big food history nerd. I have been loving it. It has not left my hands since it showed up in the mail. In the introduction, you talk about friendship bread and how it's the perfect introduction to fermentation because it speaks to how fermentation cultures shape and are shaped by our communities. So could you walk us through what you mean by that? Fermentation cultures, I mean, you know, with food history in general, which you as, you as a food history lover, you know, will know this, is like the way that our food history has been shaped is through a lot of these human connections and through how we move around the world and bring ingredients and traditions with us and how how we pass things on in families, how we um, cook together, but just the kinds of traditions we choose to carry on as well. And so, you know, food history, and I talk about this a lot in the book, is there's, you know, there's some really like nice, wonderful, good feeling things about, you know, like friendship bread is like, yay, my friend and I, like we made this bread, like we, you know, we pass this culture around and it's beautiful. But then there's other like not good parts of that history, right? And so what we have to do with each generation with these these histories is decide how we are going to bring those traditions forward and whether we're going to bring them forward. Like, how do we honor the people, you know, who were, you know, within whatever tradition, you know, how do we honor them by bringing the traditions forward? And, you know, what do we want to leave in the past and what do we want to carry forward? And I think fermentation is really useful for this because we're dealing with actual living cultures, right? Like living microbial cultures as well as our human cultures. But I view us as like this bridge, like we're standing between our ancestors in the past and the generations that haven't come yet. And we're deciding what gets carried over that bridge. And a lot of what's been carried over that bridge through history has been ferments. Um, many, many foods are fermented. So uh, lot, lots of them to uh, to explore there. One of the things I loved about the friendship bread story in the book was, you know, you described how with the fermentation process and the microbes and such, like you were just talking about, how as the, the starters kind of move from one home to another as we share it, that it kind of picks up the microbes of each different place that it's in. So it's like, you know, these ferments are unique to the very place where they're fermented. And when we share it like that, we all kind of, we have a community of microbes and we're a community of people. And I just thought it was such a fun way to think about how like these foods are, I mean, it's alive and it's a reflection 
reflection of where we're at and who we are. Absolutely. And I like it because it's we're we're very much I mean, like you said, like it's it's unique to place. But then also, you know, a lot of those fermentation microbes will be found in many places. So it's kind of, you know, it, it makes me think of, you know, human history and our relationship to the environment generally, where we have our own unique sort of situation. But then we also are situated within this larger uh, common experience. And that's, you know, that's literally reflected at the microbial level in our food, which I think is very cool. Yeah, that is very cool. In another part of the book, you talk about which comes first, beer or bread. And I guess the, the debate among scholars being which came first, the fermentation of beer or bread or how that all came to be. Could you share that story with us a little bit? Beer and bread is such an interesting story because it's one that when we think about fermentation history, it's one that people have really like latched onto. They're like, oh, like which one? Which one's first? And like, it's interesting, but I think what is interesting is to think about what those two foods tell us about people and how people were living. Because what likely happened was that we probably had both come about around the same time. We'll, you know, the archaeological record is, you know, scarce and sometimes, you know, hard to parse together for food because food isn't necessarily going to stick around for 10,000 years um, in the ground. So with those two foods, what we're really looking at is we're looking at an indication of staying more rooted in one place, right? People had been interacting with grains for quite a while and had been using them and eating them. But once we started fermenting them, you know, I mean, if you've ever home brewed beer, I mean, it's not like if you were mobile, I mean, it would be kind of hard to like pick up that big sloshing barrel of beer and haul it around, right? Sure. And yeah, it, it's it's an indication of station, being stationary. And so they, to me, it's more a reflection of a changing relationship to place and food rather than to which one coming first being the most interesting part. So you were saying, of course, and this makes sense, that it's hard to, the archaeological evidence of food is scant because food breaks down so quickly and it doesn't exist. But also these old, old recipes, this old food history, you know, there's not maybe a lot of written record there. A lot of it might be passed down orally um, from one person to the next. And then unfortunately, we see this in a lot of places in history that some folks, uh, let's say voices are louder than others and some things get left behind. So how is it that you're able to find reliable sources for all of this old information? So there's a few different ways. I mean, while we don't have a complete archaeological record, there is, um, you know, there is some. And so that's one way. And another way, you know, I mean, and I think if we look at things like queer histories and like, um, you know, black history and like history of people who were enslaved, you kind of have to look like look at the absences in the documents as much as the presence of things. So I would say with um, with ferments, you know, you're you're looking at because we have so many different foods we're looking at where we sometimes have to look both at what's missing. We have to look at the archaeological record, but we also have to look at kind of casual mentions. And so it's sometimes weaving together where these things are mentioned, like outside of food writing specifically, because cookbooks, you know, cookbooks are something that we haven't had a ton of through a lot of history, right? Like it was much more passed on orally or like maybe somebody would write a household recipe book, but we don't we don't have all of those, right? We don't have many of those. And so you're having to look sometimes at the way things that were perhaps talked about in popular culture or in other places. And so it's very much sort of weaving this tapestry through of all of these different sources and and kind of trying to, you know, home in on that that center point from there. No, it's fascinating. You know, and food is such a reflection of culture. So I, I can see why looking at like, you know, pop culture references or people's journals or like their everyday life could give us clues to this food because the food is, I mean, intertwined in our everyday life, right? Yeah, absolutely. The way that I often talk about food, I often talk about it as like acts of everyday magic. You know, I'm I'm all about magic and thinking about what magic means and all of these wonderful things. Obviously, I wrote an Oracle deck about farming, so I'm interested in magic. But 
but yeah, I, I think of it as like, you know, it's like we're putting out this beautiful thing that we're, you know, we're feeding ourselves, we're feeding others. And, you know, it's it's beautiful, but it's complex and it interweaves. I mean, like you said, with our lives in all of these different ways, you know, not all of them positive, but some of them very positive. And so it's and it's something we all have to do every day. So it's it's a history that I'm glad is finally getting its due because it's something that's been overlooked for so long. Absolutely. Now, you've obviously been fermenting foods and drinks for years and you share a bunch of recipes in the book and the Oracle deck is uh, loaded with recipes as well. What is one of your favorite ferments? What's something that's just, I don't know, really exciting or different? You know, I think... I, I always have trouble answering this question because there's so many that I love. And I think I think what I find exciting is playing with a process, like learning a new process or or refining one, but then also returning to so lacto fermentation was like the first fermentation I ever really did on my own as an adult, right? And so returning to that is always very comforting. And it's such a diverse way to go about for, you know, you can ferment all kinds of stuff in that way. And so there's there's kind of this level of excitement to a familiar process that you are applying to something that maybe you haven't used before that kind of like scratches that like comfort food itch, but also that itch to experiment. So that would be my answer. I like that. There's a uh, <laughs> Korean restaurant not far from here in the next town over, and they offer, it's almost like a flight of different kimchi. They're not all called kimchi. They have different names for it, but they're essentially, mm -hmm. you know, fermented vegetables. And I love to go and get it because the food's alive and it changes. You could go, you know, this day and enjoy it. And then you go a week later and it's, it's very different. It's such a fascinating thing to me <laughs> um, that I can imagine how exciting it would be to just use this simple technique that you figured out. But like you said, apply it to all of these different foods and get all of these different cool results. Yeah, no, it's very rewarding. And it's um, I mean, like you said, like witnessing the changes is really interesting. And there's some things that, you know, if you ferment it a little bit too long, it you know, like when I ferment sour corn, you know, if I let that go for, you know, like a month or two, it's going to be pretty mushy. But if I let, you know, something else like pickled carrots go for a month or two, you know, they'll be really sour, but they'll still be crunchy. So interesting to play around with. That's fun. All right, let's switch over to the Oracle deck that you've created, yes. which brand new and beautifully illustrated the the cards the book um it comes with a companion book that's got recipes it's a guidebook it's called so i need you to break this down for me how does this work and how did you find yourself working on an oracle deck i've seen oracle decks i've never worked with one before i'm familiar with that but if just for our listeners if you could explain what that is but i've never seen one so intertwined with food break it down for me would you julia um, so first of all, an oracle deck is basically for any listeners who are familiar with like tarot decks, right? Like divination, cards used for divination. Oracle decks are used in a similar way. They're used for divination, but they can also be used, or in this case, it can also be used for recipes. We'll get into that for in a minute. But with oracle decks, what's different about them from a tarot deck is that tarot decks have a set number of different cards and different. each card has its own meaning. And with oracle decks, it really runs the gamut. Basically, it's dealer's choice of like, when I'm writing this deck, I'm like, oh, I want to put this in there and I want to put that in there. And so you get a lot more range. As far as what this one is like and how I came to work on it. So after I handed in Our Fermented Lives, I handed in the book manuscript in uh, late 2020, early 2021. And I, I then was like, okay, I, you know, like, I have all this time now. <laughs> I'm not writing this massive book. What do I do with myself? And I had a dream that was like, you're going to make an Oracle deck. And I woke up and I was like, OK. <laughs> and so I actually so this is actually the second Oracle deck. The first one that I made was a self-published one that I illustrated um, called The Hidden Cosmos. And it's also a fermentation Oracle deck. And it was fun because it got me, you know, I had just finished this big project that has all of these collaborative elements with, you know, designers and, you know, editors and all these things. And like this next one was just me. And so it was kind of an interesting sort of palate cleanser and a different way to approach the work of writing. And then story approached me about writing an Oracle deck for them. And I was like, oh yeah, like absolutely. Cause it turns out I really like doing it. And so this one, this one has been very interesting and revelatory because while the last one I wrote was again, just me coming up with these ideas and then illustrating them and putting them, you know, into place and publishing them and, you know, shipping them and doing all the other stuff with this one, again, it's a team effort. And so it kind of is a different way of weaving that magic. 
And I'm very, very proud of the Fermentation Oracle. Basically, what makes it different from a lot of other Oracle decks, so most Oracle decks, you know, again, like a tarot deck would be a guidebook that would tell you, you know, this card means this, this card means that. And this has that, but it also has recipes for every card. So you can use it to just kind of, you know, if you're, if you magical, magical things aren't your thing, you can use it to just kind of shuffle around and find a new thing to make. It's, you know, you can use it for inspiration. You can use it for divination. You can, you can really use it in a lot of ways. And what you said earlier about Oracle decks, not usually being super food focused, you know, I've seen, I've seen a few that are, um, my favorites are ones that are herbalism focused. Okay, you're right. I have seen those. That's true. But right. But that's like kind of like adjacent. Like it's not, you know, purely like food on the table focused, right? Like, you know, like you said, there's not there's really not a lot out there. And so this is this is such an exciting new way for people to think about and work with food. So I'm I'm very excited to share it with people. While you were talking, I was like, okay, I'm going to draw a card and see what happens. I just randomly pulled a card out and I pulled the card. Imagine new paths. Amazing. Yeah, right. And I saw it's a beautiful picture of this cabbage and such. And I'm like, all right. So then I look it up in the book. And so the card meaning, of course, imagine new path. Crouchy is the delicious result of using what we have on hand and reimagining it with a little imagination. What can you transform? So that's thought provoking. Most certainly. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, there's a recipe on the next page for Crouchy. But what's blowing my mind here is that this Crouchy recipe is essentially a variation of sauerkraut and kimchi, which is what we were mm-hmm. just talking about. Yep. How does that happen? <laughs> it's all magic, man. It's all magic. It's blowing my mind a little bit, Julia. And it's funny that you, that's the card you pulled, because I actually, before we started talking I earlier this morning, I was like, I'm going to pull a card for myself, too. And like, I like to pull cards in the morning is kind of like, what's the theme for the day? Sure. And so mine kind of is a good companion to yours. Mine is uh, Transformation, which is a floral honey shrub, which is really good. And so the card's interpretation is a symbol of transformation. Honey is flower nectar reimagined through the careful intervention of bees. Combined with vinegar, it transforms again into a balanced sweet and sour drink. This card asks you to sit with the transformations in your own life. How have they changed you? And where will they take you from here? So cool companion there. But I love this because like you said, I could just get this out if I'm like, I'm feeling curious, you know, and I want to try some new food. I can just open this up and be like, okay, this is the recipe I'm going to try. Or like I can get up in the morning and then this can give me kind of, like you said, a theme for the day, something to kind Mm -hmm. of think about as the day unfolds. The little imagination, what can you transform? That's a heavy question. This is fantastic. How long did it take you to to create this? I tend to write, like the answer is it took me, the actual writing took me probably two months. I really love writing like little thought provoking vignettes and journaling questions and things like I have in addition to all of the writing that I do. I also um, have a writing coaching business and like a big thing that I do with that is like give people journaling prompts and reflection, like space for reflection and stuff. And so it's something I really love doing. And so it comes really naturally. So when they were like, yeah, write this deck, I was just like, like I busted out all of these like really <laughs> quickly. It's like, yes, they're all built up and ready. But it's really a lifetime of, of knowledge that's in all of these pages too. So I got to mention though, this is all audio. So the folks obviously can't see this, but these books and illustrations are beautiful. It's stunning. These could be prints. I would hang these up on the wall in my kitchen. I, I would too. Yeah. If they ever send me prints, I will. I will definitely hang them up. We're just about out of time here. Uh, so, Julia, what are the links that folks are going to need so they can connect with you, get their copy of your book, get their hands on the Fermentation Oracle and learn more about your work? A good jumping off point is root-kitchens.com. That's root. And that'll link you out to the Culinary Curiosity School. If they want to see links to my writing and order books, they can go to juliacskinner.com. And they can also go on Hachette's website or on bookshop.org and get the Fermentation Oracle as well as Our Fermented Lives. Fantastic. And I'm going to put all of those links down in the show notes so folks can just click right on through wherever they're interested and get their hands on some good stuff. This has been awesome. Dr. Skinner, thank you so much for being our guest today. It was so much fun talking with you. So fun. Thank you so much for having me. Would you look at that? Here we are again at the end of yet another show. Thanks again to Julia Skinner for being our guest today and to all of you for tuning in. 
Remember, if you enjoy the podcast, you can always show your support by joining our Patreon community. You can find that link and so much more at seedsandweedspodcast.com. This episode was edited and produced by all of us here at Small House Farm. And the music we're enjoying right now is a funky jazz big band piece by Nick Payne. Thanks again for joining us, friends. I'm Bevan Cohen, and we'll see you next time.